Um, and recently, BirdLife Australia has recognized Morton Bay as the single most important site for Eastern Curlew within Australia. Uh, and that's because it regularly supports uh, about 6.5% of the entire world's population of Eastern Curlew. So maybe go to the next slide, please. So we, we know that this, this area is you know, vitally important to biodiversity and migratory shorebirds. Um, it ticks all the boxes for conservation, but what exactly is the threat to, to this special place and, and why are we campaigning? Um, so just talk briefly about the threat and that is the Walker Corporation, Australia, one of Australia's um, richest and uh, biggest private development companies um, is proposing to build a 3,600 unit apartment complex and commercial uh, development uh, right on top of these Ramsar listed wetlands. Um, and they includes a 200 berth marina. And if you look at these maps, so on the left, you can see the uh, footprint of the project proposal. And if you follow the blue shaded dotted line, um, it starts at the bottom central part of the left hand side of the image. Um, it's kind of rectangular. Anything to the right of that blue dotted line is the Ramsar wetland. And you can see the majority of the footprint of the uh, proposal is actually within the Ramsar wetland. Um, so it's over 40 hectares of the Ramsar site uh, will be destroyed if this project is approved. And on the right hand side, this is just another map showing uh, important feeding habitat and roosting habitat for shorebirds. And again, uh, the majority of the footprint goes right smack on the top of these, um, these feeding habitat for the shorebirds. Next slide, please be. And this is just an artist's mock-up of what that proposal looks like if it were to um, proceed. And it's, it's actually quite shocking when you see it in, um, I guess, in, in living color. So it's, I think it's just important that we can actually visualize what Walker Corporation is proposing to do at this important space. Next slide, Steve. So why is it important that BirdLife Australia is engaged in this campaign and, and why we need the help of um, bird and nature lovers like yourself? Well, it really comes down to uh, the fact that um, not only will this project destroy important habitat for migratory shorebirds, but it will also set a very dangerous precedent if it's approved. And that's because, um, as I was saying earlier, a large, the large portion of the project is actually within the Ramsar wetlands. And Walker Corporation is proposing to permanently destroy these Ramsar wetlands to facilitate this development. Um, this, a private project of this scale uh, has never been approved within Ramsar wetlands in Australia. And as far as we're aware, it's never occurred anywhere in the world. Um, so this, this could set a very dangerous precedent, not only for similar developments to pop up in Australia's 66 other Ramsar sites, as you can see on this map, um, spread across all of Australia. I think most capital cities have a Ramsar site um, within you know, an hour or two drives, if not in the city limits. Um, so if this is approved, it could just open the floodgates for similar private developments within Ramsar wetlands across Australia. But also um, it could set the precedent that um, these Ramsar wetlands that have international protection, they're protected under federal nature laws. If they're allowed to be developed in, um, what's gonna stop uh, the development of smaller wetlands that don't have that level of protection? So we, we really see this as a precedent setting campaign and that's a, a key reason why we need to um, stop it in its tracks. Um, but also test Australia's international obligations. So we are a signatory to multiple conventions and treaties. As I was saying earlier, the, the Ramsar Convention is one such treaty, um, but there's also treaties that cover biological, biological diversity as well as migratory species. Um, so if we're signing up to these treaties and not actually implementing and protecting these important sites that are covered under these treaties, then um, you know, that really just test our obligations and, and could send a dangerous message to the world that we're not upholding those obligations. And finally, um, if this is allowed, it will just be another cut in the death by a thousand cuts for uh, migratory shorebirds, where many species have seen up to 80% you know, of the population decline in the last 30 years. And that's 
mainly due to similar coastal development projects across their flyway. Um, so we just continue to excise small portions of their important habitat. Um, those small portions uh, accumulate and can have a significant impact on the population. Next slide, please. So we know this, this site is very important by uh, biology and, and for migratory shorebirds. Um, we know that it's uh, protected under national nature laws and uh, should be protected under international uh, treaties. Um, so why is this site being proposed for a private development and how are we gonna stop it? Um, so in this slide, we just show our, our campaign goal. Um, and that's tied to our theory of change, um, which right now we're focused on the federal uh, minister for the environment, uh, Mr. Susan Lay. And that's because currently uh, this project proposal is going through an assessment through our natural nature laws, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And I'll talk about this process a little bit later today, um, but we could see a decision from the federal minister for the environment on whether to approve or reject this uh, proposal by the end of the year. Um, so we think it's really important that we start to influence her decision now, because um, that's one of the three ways that we know we can stop this proposal. Um, if for some reason uh, the federal minister does approve the project, then there'll still be opportunities for us to stop it. And that'll be through Queensland state government processes. But it is important to note that the Queensland government can step in right now and stop this proposal. And that would be by changing the boundaries of the PDA, which is a priority development area. And that's a scheme through the uh, Queensland uh, Planning Department that fast tracks proposals like this. Um, if they change the boundaries of that PDA to exclude all Ramsar wetlands, then it could stop this project. So we need to first put pressure and, and try to influence the federal minister for the environment, but we also need to be simultaneous, simultaneously being put, putting pressure on the Queensland government to step in now. Next slide, please be. Oh, I have to click through them all, sorry. So this is a quick kind of timeline. There's, there's not really times to this, but I guess this is the process for the campaign. So we're about to enter one of the critical stages for the campaign. And as we mentioned at the top, this is the EIS public comment period. Uh, and EIS is an environmental impact statement. So that is a formal process that Walker Corporation has to go through um, to, to show how this project will impact the environment. Um, and there will be a public comment period um, that will open as soon as the Walker Corporation releases that. Um, we don't know when that will be. It could be a few weeks from now, it could be a few months, but we will keep you informed. But that will be a critical moment for us to be able to really show um, the large, massive opposition to this project and why we need to protect important sites like uh, Morton Bay, Ramsar uh, wetlands and wetlands across Australia. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep you updated on that process and I'll go into a little bit more about the timelines for this specific process. but. Um, as we continue in the campaign, we, we also need to put some pressure on federal members of parliament because we know this will ultimately be a political decision from the minister for the environment. So we need to start getting in the ears of your elected representatives. And especially if you live in an electorate that has a Ramsar wetland, um, we can send you that map that was in that slide a few slides ago showing all the Ramsar wetlands across Australia it would be really important for you to raise your concerns about the precedent Toondah Harbour would have on your local Ramsar wetland or even just your local wetland and raise that with your member of parliament so they can uh, take that up the chain to their party leaders and ultimately uh, to the Minister for Environment. And then finally, uh, the campaign peak. So as I was saying, the Minister for the Environment could potentially make a final decision later this year and we'll really need to maximize our pressure around that decision point. Uh, so we'll develop some uh, calls to actions that we'll be asking you to engage with so we can really uh, influence and, and put the, the pressure on the Minister for Environment and make it really easy for her to make a good decision here. So um, I might just hand it back over to Fee. That was just a brief kind of snapshot of the campaign, but Fee will talk about those case studies of recent successful campaigns. Um, and then we'll dive into the EIS process later on. 
How do you think? Great, thanks, Andrew. I briefly touched on the tuned reliance at the beginning of the call. Um, I, I wanted to just go through in detail who's in that alliance. It is an alliance of BirdLife Southern Queensland, the Queensland Waiter Studies Group, um, the local ACF, the um, Bayside Group, Red, our Redlands, BirdLife Redlands Group, um, TWIS, um, the Friends of Stradbroke Island and um, HSI and EDO. And I hope I didn't miss anyone there, but I just wanted to really just um, kind of strengthen that, how important alliances are. So looking at, um, we've got three case studies today. I'm just gonna quickly go over them um, and just briefly. So firstly, we have the Ralph Bay um, conservation area, which is um, south of Hobart in Tasmania there. Same um, proponent, same villain, uh, Walker Corporation, um, who proposed a 477 lot canal housing and marina development um, in for the feeding habitat of redneck stints, eastern curlews, one of Australia's um, largest populations of the pied oyster catcher and a critically endangered um, spotted handfish. Uh, similar um, concerns um, as tundra, loss of natural beauty, loss of recreational values that are enjoyed both by residents and visitors. Um, noise, dust, visual traffic impacts over a period of years. In the case of tundra, it could be 20 to 30 years. Um, and an increased um, popular um, pollution um, by urban and marina runoff. Now, the tactics that that community used were forming an alliance, like what we've done, uh, roadside protests and surveys of the community, which we've done, direct lobbying of the environment minister through meetings, emails and submissions that we've done. Not submissions are what we're working on, obviously, um, shortly. Uh, candidate surveys and candidate forums, which we've done, and public forums. Now that um, uh, proposal was rejected in 2010 by the um, Tasmanian Premier, Premier who exec, uh, accepted the Tasmanian Planning Commission's recommendation to reject the proposal on environmental grounds. There is a little video there, but we won't have time for that. I'll share that in the um, follow-up email. Next is Turtle Cove. You would have all heard about this um, in, neck, in the Queensland neck of the woods there, up there in um, Harvey Bay region. Um, here we had a proposal to be built uh, a, a retirement village to be built um, right next to a um, mangrove point south Claypan, which was um, on an important shorebird site in the Grand, Great Sandy Strait Ramsar wetland there. The community was um, uh, uh, Queensland Waiter Studies Group, QWSG, and the Riverheads Action Group, who campaigned for seven years. Without that data on surveys from the QWSG, we would not have been alerted to this, um, this proposal and the significance of this site. So some tactics there um, were to form an action group like they did, um, provide that shorebird count evidence, respond through submissions to the impact assessment, very similar to the EIS that's happening now. And a survey and petition went to the mayor of the community that showed that 80% of the community um, supported the campaign. Here we saw a rejection last year by our very own environment minister, Susan Lay, um, who rejected it due to impacts on Mosque Shorebird and the Great Strand Sandy Strait. This was a really, for us in the Tunda campaign, this was an absolute highlight um, because it, it, it paves the way a little bit for what we could see in the future. And we got really excited. <laughs> she, she does, she, she sees us. So something really recently here, um, down here in Western Point in Victoria was the AGL proposal for a 300 metre long floating gas terminal and a Ramsar um, listed wetland in Western Port. Uh, environmental issues, I'm just gonna mention one because there are a lot, but it was 180 Olympic swimming pools of chlorinated water would go into the port every day. Um, you can just imagine the knock on effect there. Um, tactics were form, forming an alliance again, environmental for NGOs, local MPs were on board, um, similar to um, some of our MPs in, um, around Brisbane. Um, community groups working together, there was um, public pressure through events, rallies, actions, letters and meetings to the minister and meetings with the local MPs again. And they saw over 6,000 6, public submissions telling their story of community, which I'll come to later. Big win for that campaign to see that rejected by the Vic Planning Minister, Richard Wayne, who said that the Crib Point Terminal would have an unacceptable environmental impact on Western Port. There is hope in this campaign and because we can see, um, you know, we have won in other campaigns around the country in very similar situations. So I'm just going to jump to the next slide. I think I'm handing it back to you now, Andrew. Great, thanks, Fee. So I just wanted to briefly touch on the environmental impact statement public comment period again. 
Um, so we know this, this opportunity, it's not gonna be a decision point right now um, because the Minister for the Environment will have to consider the final EIS that the Walker Corporation will have to develop after this public comment period. And that could be a number of months from now, but this process will be really important for us to, to show our power and to show our collective concerns about this proposal, specifically within uh, important wetlands like Ramsar wetlands and important habitat for migratory shorebirds. Um, and it will, it will play a role in influencing the minister's decision later this year. Uh, and it'll allow us to demonstrate the importance of biodiversity uh, and the Australia-wide opposition to this dangerous proposal. So once the public comment period opens, we'll really be um, asking everyone online today and, and really any nature lovers across Australia to, to put in some submissions to this process and engage in this process. As Fee was saying, um, some of those case studies, there were you know, thousands of uh, submissions from the community and that really uh, did influence the ultimate decision from that decision maker. I think the Western Port decision, there were 6, 000, over 6,000 submissions that were majority opposed to the process. And in the um, uh, decision document that the minister released, that they referenced those 6,000 submissions specifically. So we know that a quantity of submissions will influence the decision of the environment minister later this year, but we also need really quality submissions that um, touch on why you care about um, the specific issue and, and what precedent will say, set for your local uh, patch of wetlands or your local Ramsar wetland. So next slide, please, please. So this is just a quick snapshot of the IES process. Um, so right now, the Walker Corporation are finalizing their draft environmental impact statement document. Uh, so that will have to go to the Federal Department of Environment. We'll review it just to make sure it stacks up with the guidelines that they set a few years back. Um, if it does, then uh, Walker Corporation will have to release that draft EIS for public scrutiny. Um, that will be an opportunity for all of us to review the documents and um, if there's any major issues that we see, we can address those in our submissions, um, but also to, to show that we, um, we're not going to sit back and allow a private development within internationally important wetlands. Um, so after the EIS public comment closes, um, I should note that it will be at least 20 business days that you'll be able to review those uh, documents and put in submissions. We have requested that that will be extended and we're hopeful that we will get an extension, but we won't know until we actually see the documents. So as soon as the EIS is released, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you with more information. Um, but the process after the public comment period is the Walker Group will take all those public comments on board and address any key issues and submit a report to the Department of Environment. Uh, the Department of Environment will then review that final environmental impact statement and then make a re recommendation to the Environment Minister. And as soon as that recommendation is with, uh, sent to the Environment Minister, as soon as it's on her desk, then I believe she'll have 40, uh, statutory 40 business days to make a decision. Um, so this, I guess this shows that um, this timeline is really critical right now, but the final decision point could be, uh, you know, months from now. So we just really need to first ramp up the pressure and, and engage in this critical submission process, but also be prepared to um, put some pressure on the minister later on this year. Um, so I think I might just hand it back over to Fee to talk about how we can structure your um, submission to the EIS process. Again, we won't be able to really put in detailed submissions until we see the documents, but there is one aspect to the submissions that we think is important, something that you can start on developing right now, and that's including your story and why you are really uh, interested and care about this specific issue. So back over to you, Fee. Thank you, Andrew. I just saw a comment, um, quick comment in the chat there on um, the thickness of an EIS. Um, we probably have a few minutes to respond to that if either Andrew or Erin wanted to respond to that um, chat. Well, 
What was the specific question? So, uh, yeah, if, if, if it is anything like the Earl Hill Canal Estate in Cairns, the EAS is 30 centimetres thick, you will need an engineer to keep, have, keep an eye on those docks. So maybe just like, what, what are we planning on doing there? When it comes yeah, to so the, the documents, the, there will be thousands of pages. We, we really don't know what that will look like, but as the commenter mentioned that previous EIS, they are really thick and technical. So that is one of the reasons that we've requested that extension of the public comment period, because we know it's going to be a lot of documents to review. Um, BirdLife Australia will obviously focus on what we are experts in, and that is on shorebirds and Ramsar wetlands. But we do have an alliance of partners that Fiona mentioned at the top that are, are going to be looking into those other issues like traffic and engineering, um, acids, uh, sulfate soils. Uh, there's many aspects of this environmental impact statement that aren't specifically related to shorebirds and Ramsar wetlands, and we just don't have the expertise to review that, but we are working with other groups that will be. Yeah, I think that it's a good question because there, um, uh, there's definitely um, a large number of experts that are following this particular proposal from all around Australia and actually throughout the region, even internationally. Um, so I think for um, folks like yourselves on the line, I think that, um, and Fee's gonna go into this um, in the, the next section of the workshop, the issue is not gonna be so much about feeling like um, every single submission needs to address every single um, kind of detailed technical aspect of the, um, the EIS, it's going to also be about demonstrating um, how important this um, threat, you know, the, the potential impact and damage that this proposal um, could cause is to the community as well. Um, just before this workshop, Andrew Fee and I were talking about EIS processes and the fact that um, on one hand, you have this very kind of technical formal process where um, you, you may feel like you need to be a real um, scientific or engineering or what have you expert to participate. But the other aspect of it, um, which I know a lot of you probably from your previous experience and other campaigns will know, is that it, it's also um, you know, an issue of demonstrating community concern and building up momentum and, and demonstrating, I guess, um, the power and um, and um, real um, unity in, in um, the community's perceptions of a proposal, um, because at the end of the day, the person who signs off um, yes or no on these kinds of proposals is a, is a politi um, politician, is the Minister for the Environment, and they will take into account um, the technical aspects, but also the concerns of their um, of voters and, and the community. So um, I think it's good to have both of those those kind of um, elements in mind when when you're thinking about this. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. And I should note that after we review the documents, we'll obviously for Life Australia will be putting in a, uh, an organization submission, and we'll take out some key points and develop a submission guideline that can give you some. I guess ideas to help formulate your submission, including that local community concern or um, you know, Australia-wide concern that Aaron was just mentioning. So we'll make sure that you have the tools that you need to make that submission. Thanks, Aaron and Andrew. So just to um, pick up on the um, heartfelt side of telling your story, uh, we've heard that, that, you know, as both Andrew and Aaron mentioned that this is so important for, from, to come from the community, from individuals and also from community groups. Um, and, you know, also to, to put yourself as an individual into your community to tell the story. So there's a structure to do that, but I'll just quickly, um, this slide is really just talking basically back to what I just said, that, you know, it's so important that we think, think of it from our self perspective, from our community perspective, and also add in a way forward. In the last, probably about, I think even from the beginning of our Nature Laws campaign, which was kind of like the, the foundation of the Toonda Harbour campaign, um, we um, worked with all of our, um, our network of branches around the country to pull out individual stories um, and to tell stories of people living in community. Now, we've heard, I said there, the Environment Department wants to hear stories from the heart of the community. Stories change hearts and minds. Now, what I've got here is um, a foundation and a structure from an organizer called Marshall Gans, who was uh, and from the US, who was one of the Obama campaign's organizers. 
who is also responsible for implementing this structure um, into the campaign. Basically, um, this is going to be completely like, um, you know, obvious to a lot of you, but it's important to have your story in a structure that can be heard. So just as an example, like the, the plot of the story begins usually with an unexpected challenge. Um, the character is confronted. Then there's an urgent need to pay attention. Um, then you have to make a choice. And then from the, sometimes, it, mostly it's a choice you're unprepared for. Um, then that choice yields an outcome and the outcome teaches a moral. And the moral is, it's morally wrong as an example that we let stand by and let birds die in their wetlands and all species. So I'll say that again, it feels morally wrong to let birds, their wetlands and all species die when we know something can be done, it can simply be stopped. Now the structure that was used was what they call challenge choice and outcome. And here is, as I was saying, you, you're confronted, we're all confronted with a challenge here. Some of you live locally, some of you travel through the red threadlands, through Toon Harbour, you might go to Stradbroke, you might have grown up there. You know, the challenge is, it's your talent for whatever reason. Um, then we have to make a choice. Why did we make that choice? Why is it important to us? Where do we get the courage? Is it intergenerational? Is it something that comes from our grandparents and their pet grandparents? Is that many generations of you living in the area? Um, you know, were you taught, told the same stories that, you know, are you telling the same stories to your grandchildren? What's the future look like also? How does this make you feel? And then the next step is, you know, what's the outcome? What's the solution? Why do you feel this way? How do, you, how do others feel? How do you want, sorry, how do you want others to feel? This is, a, I need to say that this is, I'm telling you this in like a couple of minutes, whereas this is an hour long workshop. It's, I've even been to a day long workshop on how to tell your story through a, a campaign lens. Now, today we're just gonna to touch on this. Um, this is our first workshop um, in a series of workshops around the AES because we don't know when it's gonna drop. As Andrew said, it could be next week, could be in a couple, well, it won't be in a couple of weeks, but it could be in the next month, two months or three months. But as soon as we do find out that that's been lodged and it's open for public comment, this is when we'll be running more extensive um, workshops on telling story. I've just spent the last week reading um, submissions from our supporter base on the EPBC Act um, to, to um, submissions for the Senate inquiry. We did a couple of workshops on story of self before that. It was quite phenomenal to read people's stories broken down into this structure. They're very compelling when, when they're done this way. A lot of you on the line, are probably, I'm sure, have written a lot of submissions in your time. So, uh, and I'm sure you've done a great job, but this is just one way of um, actually approaching it. So what I want to do next um, is we're going to flick you into um, uh, breakout rooms just for 10 minutes um, so you can meet each other. What's also been really important for us in this big campaign um, is to continue to build the, the power of all of you that have been in this campaign for so long to get you to connect and meet each other. And also I think just to realise that we're not in this alone. Um, I know I can see from people jumping in the chat that there's people who are here from Adelaide, Perth, um, you know, some who, are, a lot of you are from Brisbane, um, New South Wales, that everyone is from everywhere who have called in here today, which is fantastic because, you know, we've had so much interest in this campaign nationally from all of our supporter base. We would love to see 10,000 submissions, that would be amazing. So what we're going to do is um, just drop you into um, a, a meeting room with one other person. Um, we're going to give you a couple of minutes just to um, chat to each other about what, you know, what's motivated you to care about tuned it. Some of you might have done your PhDs there, study there, do surveys there, live there, holiday there. There's lots of reasons. Why can't you stand by and watch, watch this injustice? And this is the choice part. Why are you here today and why can't you just let this one go by? And also, you know, what, you know, you'll be putting a submission in. What, you know, why are you going to be putting a submission in also? I can see that I put, said there, what will you be putting a submission in? I meant to say, why will you be putting a submission in? Apologies for that. So we're going to um, put you in a breakout for 10 minutes. We'll see you back um, here in 10 minutes and um, we'll open up for um, chat time and also um, let you know what's next. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you in a minute. I have a question, Fiona. If, um, if by chance uh, the Australian government goes ahead and approves the development, because of the Ramsar issue, is it possible to actually file a case with the International Court uh, against the Australian government for um, reneging on the Ramsar? That's a really good question. I might throw that one to Erin. 
Sorry, I just had my um, mouse on the other screen. Look, I'm not sure about international legal um, options. I think, um, and Andrew might might want to jump in here. I, I don't think that there's anything really um, binding that it is possible to be done because the treaty is is sort of there to be upheld by the participants rather than it being something that um, we're legally liable for is my understanding. Okay. However, um, there'd be a big, um, it, it, it would be a very internationally embarrassing thing, I think, um, if, if Australia were to be framed as, as undermining this international treaty, particularly given we um, helped to, you know, start it. Andrew, did you have anything to add to that? So what was the question? Just how the rams are treated? International legal options, if we were to be seen to undermine Ramsar, I, I think the thing is, most likely what would happen is the Ramsar, they, they wouldn't, they would say that we are able to, to go ahead with it. There's not really anything they can do formally. That's right. They leave it up to the nation states to actually implement the, um, the convention. But I mean, there are mechanisms under the Ramsar convention for like a site visit from the secretary to come out and see, um, see the proposal and provide advice or, um, demonstrate concern, but that has to come from the Australian government. Uh, that's not something that we can initiate. Um, like Aaron was saying, it's more of the international reputation that's at stake. And I don't know if Aaron said, so BirdLife's part of the largest conservation partnership in the world. So that's BirdLife International. And we have partners um, you know, all across the East Asian, Australasian flyway. Um, so that's the flyway that uh, Eastern Curlew and other migratory shorebirds use to get to their breeding grounds. and. We know that our partners across the flyway are very concerned about this um, proposal and are watching it very carefully. Um, so I'm sure they're having conversations um, with their their net, um, their state governments uh, across the flyway too. So it's not just um, there's not just conversations in Australia; it's, it's happening across the world. We have to find some uh, politicians who are willing to uh, actually feel the embarrassment. <laughs> feel on the hook for this because they're they're pretty sparse right now i think yeah yeah so, so yeah, um, i might just um hand over to phil straw yeah. see he's on and phil's been very involved in the ramsar convention from the beginning so phil if you have anything to add about, to that question thanks andrew it's interesting that at the last cop of ramsar in dubai bird life international um asked directly the australian government what they were doing about this because this was already known worldwide and it's already been uh, because they were quite critical of it but of course as you, as you say legally there is no uh, uh, standing because uh, the Ramsar Convention is um, means that the outside of is, is protected um, for whatever the, the um, standards are but unless it's in the um, national interest it can be changed and I don't think we could argue that this is in a national interest by, by any chalk um, but um, so I think uh, what I'd like to know, as I mentioned to you before offline, that um, I'd like to see EIS because I saw some of the footprints and a lot of the things there because I was involved in the Rolfs Bay development proposal. And interestingly, I was um, asked to be the Commonwealth nominee for Marketing Species. And that's, that actually happened, uh, helped to happen um, to, to, to prevent that uh, development going ahead. Um, so we've got a, you know, really um, serious discussion and look at all the detail and then that one there um, the consultants uh, made a few uh, paths and everything else and a lot of those things they got tripped up on and um, the QC was running the, uh, the expert panel for the um, state government because they went for or against it um, uh, sort of um, said you know, put a proposal that they didn't develop not go ahead so at this stage, we're only just getting to the EIS. I mean, it would have been good to have all this information to look at and work on, uh, you know, the last couple of years. But um, so until this happens, there's a lot, going to be a lot of work to do. And um, I need to look at, and with your help, uh, all the points that I would look at and question uh, without reading <laughs> the 10,000 pages or whatever it is. Yeah, it's going to be, going to be a big document. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for all your work over the years too, with, with work with you a lot. It's been, you know, amazingly informative and fantastic. Thank you.
I'm going to wrap it up because we're one minute away, but I'm so happy to see you all smiling today. Um, I look forward to, but I'm going to quickly, I'm going to share screen um, again, just to um, keep, keep going with what's, what's next and um, just a few of the resources um, that we have available. Uh, firstly, um, the check out our Aquabirds website. Aaron, can you just um, put that um, link in the in the chat there? Um, what we have there is um, some fact sheets. There's a petition. We've got a campaign video if you haven't seen it. There's media media articles in the um, four corners of the program if you didn't see it. Um, posters to share in the community um, that will be coming, and then also um, closer to the public comment period, we will be um, uploading a submission guide some actions for you guys to follow, apart from working on your stories and your submission, or your story part of your submission anyway, is um, the Lights in the Mud event, the um, community action that will be happening out at Chippenda Harbour on the 8th of May, which is the World Migratory Bird Day. Um, and also just, yeah, please, um, we'll, we'll be in touch with you. We'll follow up after this um, webinar today with more links, but also, keep you on top of um, what's coming up with workshops. I've just noticed another spelling mistake on my slide. Apologize for that, but just keeping you up to date with the two more workshops we'll be doing online, and that will be focused more on story itself and submission writing. But also we have um, a couple of local organizers in the community that will be running face-to-face -to -face, uh, face -face events for those of you that are in Brisbane. So if there's any, nothing else that um, anyone has to add, or, or quickly, I, I know we're running over time, but were there any other questions in the chat, Erin, that, that you wanted to answer or anything else that you thought you wanted to do? Um, look, I saw someone was just asking about the faunal extinction inquiry and there's definitely um, quite a few different Senate parliamentary processes that are happening that we're keeping an eye on. Um, and we are actively working um, with our partners, um, including um, uh, ACF. So, um, yeah, that's... The, um, we are looking at all of those options. Um, but um, yeah, if there are any other questions um, that we weren't able to get to today, we'll either endeavour to get back to them um, via email or perhaps just get in touch with us um, directly via email and, and we'll, um, we'll follow up with you if that's okay. Great, thank you so much, Erin. And thank you, everyone. I was just laughing, laughing at the last comment in the, in the chat there. Let's work on that, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again in the future and at our next workshop and webinar. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye. There's one person in the waiting room that never made it in, but I might just close out the meeting. Is that Andrew that's just joined? I don't know, it was Andy. I think Andrew, Andrew's off. Um, oh, okay. Know. Just for now, I don't know what happened. I just lost connection. <laughs> Everyone froze. Are you staying on the line with Phil or are you going to jump in another chat on Zoom? I think we have another Zoom, so it's fine. You can close it out. Okay, cool. cool. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you, everybody.